Hello and welcome to this episode of In The Bunch, the world's fastest moving cycling magazine show. A completely new format, as you can see as well. We trust you'll enjoy it along with us. The season of the Grand Tours is what it is at the moment between the Giro d'Italia and the Tour de France. Talking about Giro d'Italia, one name on everybody's lips at the moment. Chris Froome was brilliant in the Giro d'Italia. He started off badly, had a crash, won on the Zonkalan, then lost his legs at the end of week two, going to the final one. Rest day seems to have brought him back. The time trial was great for him, although he didn't win that one. But then all hell broke loose on the final Friday. 85 kilometers on his own he went over a gravel section, Alay's African heritage, to clinch the Malia Rosa. That left him 40 seconds ahead of Dumoulin with two days still to race. Col de la Finestra was the perfect place to do it. Gravel road, uh, I guess, reminds me a little bit of riding on the roads back in Africa. Um, just, just felt good and thought, now it's, now it's, it's now or never, I have to try. Well, that fantastic effort from Chris Froome getting him his third successive Grand Tour victory in the talkies now. Can he go on to make it four with the Tour de France oh, and even five with the Vuelta a España? Eddie Merckx and Bernard Eno stand on three wins. If he gets the Tour de France, he's head and shoulders above them. Number five would just put him into another world. Lance Armstrong, in fact, we believe, has regarded this as the best ride of the modern era. That's stage 19 of Chris Froome. So that says a heck of a lot. Always ask my mates in the bar whether they'd rather await an all-black kickoff or the first ball of a five-day cricket test as the opening batsman, or maybe even that first jump of the Grand National. I think it's far, far worse being involved in a bunch sprint in one of these Grand Tours. Our young sprinter of hope is a guy called Ryan Gibbons, riding on our mentioned data. Certainly, the man of the match from South Africa's perspective in the past Giro d'Italia, where the South Africans were quiet, but young Gibbons knocked on that podium's door throughout the race. He tells you what it's like to face that 80 km an hour surge, which makes the Grand National look like a Sunday school tour. It's a complete scramble. Um, though those riders who do have teammates and, and do have a lead out, they kind of tooth and nail to hold that wheel. Other riders like myself, you know, you're trying to move up at, at the same time piggyback off someone else but but not kind of riding in the wind so yeah there's elbowing and swearing and bumping it, it, it comes a lot comes down to how brave you are how stupid you are and, and how confident you are one of the stages of this year's Giro d'Italia went right past Lake Izio, the hometown of John Lee Augustin. Now, John Lee Augustin, you might recall, young South African who came from PE, the Windy City, of the Augustin family. In fact, Wesley, a very good BMX rider and a brilliant mountain biker, John Lee sticking to the road, won the national title as a junior and went on to be one of the big prospects of South Africa. Rode on Barlow World. In fact, with Chris Froome, with Robbie Hunters, this world, uh, young Ryan Cox was in that team as well. That was the, the dream team, in fact, of South Africa. He unfortunately suffered, ended his career with a broken hip. But before that, he was that famous rider who in 2008, alongside the great, scaled the biggest climb of the then Tour de France, which was uh, for the Henry de Grange trophy. Went up the top first, but unfortunately went over the edge first as well. In uh, what we can chuckle about now, but it could actually have killed John Lee Augustine. He's a brilliant narrator and tells us what it feels like going over the top first and unfortunately over the edge first. So basically on that day, uh, we had a, it was a very tough stage. We had to try and get in the breakaway. And um, I, I still remember climb, climbing this very long climb. Uh, I remember the, the DS shouting. Uh, so when I'm ready, uh, I need to, I need to go. I felt the right moment and uh, went as hard as I could. Um, at that moment, I crested the highest start road in Europe, but uh, I didn't know that. Um, so yeah, I went over first, uh, went down the descent, the guys got caught back up to me. Um, just, yeah, on the, on the corner, I just took the wrong line. Uh, <laughs> as I went over, I, I saw that this is like a vertical cliff and I thought that I'll see you guys in the next lap. Um, so basically, what, what went through my mind is, uh, yeah, this, obviously the stage when it's over, and how am I going to get back up this thing? Luckily, the the fan, uh, one of the fans next to the road, slid down and pushed me back up to the road, uh, where I could get a next uh, the, the the spare bike, and slowly work my way down the mountain to the finish. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So got got to the finish line in one piece, and um, I was very very happy. To be to still be walking around in uh, in one piece. I didn't even get one scratch. 
Um, and the, the, the journalist straight away started asking me questions, you know, how I started road in Europe and how did the crash go and I, I just didn't realize that it had been so famous and I didn't even realize it was on TV. So, um, yeah, um, obviously couldn't win the, the stage, which uh, was very disappointing, but um, at the other end, actually got quite famous for the, for the crash. Johnny works these days for an online bike shop in Italy and of course does his hobby part-time activity of taking cycle tours in that mythical cycling country of Italy. Takes us to Bormio in Italy on the foothills of the absolutely mythical Stelvio Pass where producer Crozier Ghost caught up with John Lee over of course a glass of something cold and obviously reddish where John Lee had this to say about Chris Froome and of course what he's up to these days. So yeah, I well, was the Giro Italia guiding some some clients and um, it was actually quite nice to, to see the Giro passing through my town and um, also seeing Chris Froome was actually quite nice because we're big mates and um, I'm very happy for him that he did so well in his career and he got that stage. Uh, obviously I mean uh, he did think like yeah I could have been there but you know that's that's life and um, I'm, I'm very I'm very happy for for him and it's it's, it's hard work eh? It's, uh, it looks easy on the TV, it looks like a nice lifestyle, but you know, it's, uh, it's very tough. Uh, and not a lot of guys can do that. Uh, so I take my hats off for him. Yeah. Arrivederci da Italia e ci arriviamo presto. Ciao, Senor Augustine. Well, if you fancy a nice bike tour, a fantastic one in Italy, Italy bike tours, that's where you can catch up with Johnny Augustine. He'll take you, but certainly not over the Henry de Grange climb, I promise you, this time. Sticking to the Tour de France, the big build-up now, the big races there, Criterium Dauphiné. Always a good indication of who's got legs and who's not for the Tour de France. Jeroen Thomas this time stayed on two wheels to win the overall honours, but South Africa's Daryl Impey grabbed the first stage victory, put him in the lead overall in the race, went on to podium as well, and Impey went on to hold on to the sprinter's green jersey all through this major international tour. A wonderful result for Daryl. Look, the, the sprint jersey was a little bit uh, different to previous years where we only had actually two sprint stages, so... Um, you know, the rest of the points were really left um, on the high mountaintop finishes. I mean, it, it wasn't really so much of defending the jersey. It was more about just um, being hopeful that the climbers didn't accumulate um, too many points. So I don't think I've ever gone into Tour de France feeling so well prepared as, you know, as this year. So, and obviously, you know, a great start to the season and then backing it up with a couple of wins along the way. Chris Froome preparing in the Giro d'Italia. Jaron Thomas going this way with the Criterium Dauphiné and the Tour of Suisse, the other big, big build-up tour to the Tour de France, was won by Richie Port, a long-time lieutenant, in fact, of Chris Froome's on the then Sky team, Port moving across to BMC and winning his own national tour for the Swiss brand of bicycle. Very sad, though, that the founder of BMC and, of course, Phonak Hearing Systems, Andy Rees, passed away very sadly in April. So it would have been great for Andy to see this victory. But now getting on to the world's biggest bike race, the world's biggest annual sporting event, the Tour de France. Stage 17 this time, a 65-kilometer distance, but three calls built in. Sounds like the Eastern Province Championships out of Greenbushes, but with those calls, it's a Tour de France stage. The big difference, it's a grid start like Formula One. Now you've seen the F1 stuff, one, two, three, four, five, etc. The riders, lots of talk about it, but they've all been the same 100 meter radius at the start. I don't think it'll make any difference other than a great spectacle. Elle est vainqueur, Grand Prix Perouet à Belgique, Rouen de Ploué, un coureur Afrique du Sud. Natuurlijk, of course, South Africa's Rouen de Ploué, on the very same day, he won another race in Europe the year before, cracking a victory in Belgium, just south of Brussels, that is. Rouen de Ploué, a tall, sprint-type rider, a single-day man, definitely not a tour rider, making a bit of a name for himself on the continent. Cobbles thrown into that event as well. Rouen struggling a little bit, though, on the visa side, the work permit side. South Africa, short-stay visas of three months, not really conducive to campaigning abroad. But Rouen de Ploué, very fortunate, in fact, to be in Belgium these days after a near miss in one of South Africa's foremost five-day, multi-day stage race events in the individual time trial. Remember this one? Well, certainly big problems there for Rowan de Ploy on that occasion, which were averted luckily by fractions of a second. Cycling South Africa beleaguered, maybe under threat, perhaps not as flush as what they'd like to be, because I do believe the riders are still traveling on their own steam. At this point, it made a decision 
to up the vice president, Asa Tatazi, into the seat, the vacant seat of the president of the National Cycling Body. That's, of course, after William Newman uh, surrendered the job after a vote of no confidence earlier in 2018. An interesting story, though. We believe that Raymond Hogg, an ex-cyclist, a Southern Transvaal rider, and in fact probably the founder of professional cycling in South Africa, when he founded the then Hour After Hour team, which was a amateur team. They were in the amateur ranks, but they earned 50 rand a month. I can tell you that was my pro contract on that team, unless the others got a hell of a lot more. But Raymond Rock put his neck out there and started a nine-man amateur professional, whatever it was, but they raced properly. And it was a really well-run, tightly organized body. He apparently had a rescue plan of 150 million rand for cycling South Africa, which for whatever reason, they didn't take the bait for and of, and they are still more or less where they are. We hope that they can get together with Raymond, who has a really good scheme to get cycling afloat, sailing, and going onto the deep seas again. If you've slogged your way to the finish of the 94.7 in recent editions of the race, the last 25 difficult kilometers been maybe just a little bit too much for you or too big a challenge, rest assured, this year's race runs the other way. So the organizer felt that to include more riders, to give the charity riders a chance and to get the average cyclist a fairly accessible uh, event this time around, they're running the race in the opposite direction. The big obstacles now come on the Route 55, leaving the start, leaving the rest of the race undulated but not that demanding. For the professionals, of course, the sprinters already have dominated this race in all of its editions. The short distance ensures that with an easier effort now with the sprinters uh, getting a bigger chance, we predict that it will be a sprinter's derby as it always has been. But swinging now from 94.7 kilometers right up to Louis Trichot, the north of South Africa, 175 kilometers for the Kremertat Classic. For many years, four stages built into one day for the normal riders. On the odd occasion, they've run that as one singular distance. This year, they had two options on the menu. The professionals doing a continuous 175 kilometer. The other riders are four stages. Young Mark Pritzen, first year signing on the BCX team of Malcolm Langers, really coming good to record his first and maiden victory as a professional in this event. So I did go into the race with the goals to win it. Um, just unreal that it actually happened. I uh, still can't believe it. I don't know what my next goal will be. Just going to enjoy this win for now. Carla Uber also bouncing back as well. She opened up the score in 2018, winning four or five big classics on the trot. Went a little off the boil and she's back right at top of the podium now. Taking a left right off the tarn into the dirt of the trans Irlands in the Gantus Valley right near Port Elizabeth. 160 kilometer mountain bike race, one stage. 48 year old Stephen Shirley and the queen of South African mountain biking, Yolanda de Villiers, just too good for the field in the men's and women's categories. As you'd expect on the world's fastest moving cycling magazine show, a story of true speed. Remember the name Campbell? There was the late Sir Malcolm Campbell. He of the Bluebird famed at about 500 kilometers an hour in a car way back in the 20s, 30s and even the 40s. His son Donald came along, did 500 kilometers an hour in a boat on water. Unfortunately, that cost him his life sometime in 1967. Comes along Neil Campbell, the British and Commonwealth speed record holder on a bicycle. He's now broken the European version of this record with a ride of 217 kilometers an hour. The way they achieved this, the ride is very protectedly clad. Of course, he gets towed up to a speed and then once the cable's released, they time him. 217 kilometers an hour takes some doing. Please do not try this at home behind your wife's station wagon because the results will be absolutely frightening. And now the medal protocol ceremony on this episode of In The Bunch, the world's fastest moving cycling magazine show. In the bronze medal position, sad story of Stuart Murray who might have to quit the world of mountain biking unless he can find a meaningful sponsor. We'll keep you posted on the show. Second wheel, the silver medal goes to Mark Pritzen, a brilliant victim in the Kremataut Classic and also winner. The Vets and Juniors multi-day stage race recently, but oh, the gold medal, 94.7 cycle challenge, turning it the other way around to make it much more accessible to all. If you've enjoyed the show as much as what we've done doing it for you, please don't forget to subscribe to us and to tap the bell. It's Johnny couldn't be offered could see a host the entire in the bunch team saying ciao for now. But before we go. 217 kilometers an hour, do you think this head would do it? 
Maybe the strong westerly MP this afternoon would be a great help on that score. We could read out the record books forever, but we have to stop before we hit the Indian Ocean. Cha-cha.